The, st the section starting at verse 10 is titled, The Woman Who Fears the Lord. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamb does, lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates, where he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Well, friends, welcome to Trinity Church on, on Mother's Day. And if you have come particularly because it is uh, Mother's Day, then can I warmly welcome you this morning and, of course, welcome everyone else as well. Uh, Mother's Day was begun in uh, 1907 by a lady, a Christian lady, named Anne Marie Jarvis. And uh, she wanted a day set aside in which people could spend that day with their mother. And she knew that. It was, that was hard to find in the, in the humdrum of life and the things that needed to be done, so she suggested that we make a day in which that could be done. Uh, ironically, I think, later she was imprisoned uh, in the 1920s for protesting against the way in which Mother's Day had become materialistic. And so instead of spending the day with their mum, people would send presents to their mum, and she said, that's not the way it's meant to work. So they, so they put her in prison, which is sort of slightly amusing. Uh, it may surprise you, I suppose, when you think about the materialism of uh, Mother's Day, that uh, $1.2 billion will be spent in Australia on Mother's Day today. So I don't know who's getting that $1.2 billion. Uh, there you go. That's a lot of money, isn't it? And I think we all sense that there's something uh, special about mothers and something special about a mothering and even if we haven't had a, had a positive experience of that we sense there's something good about it and uh, we sense that it's uh, it's an immense uh, sacrifice of time and of life uh, given by uh, so many mothers and there's a level of unconditional love linked to mothering that you don't see in too many other places. When Napoleon was asked how, how, we could, how we could restore the prestige of France, he said, give us better mothers. He saw it as a key to the whole thing. When Dr. James 
Dobson, a well-known author and psychologist, was asked about the role of mothers and asked about the role of homemakers. He said, speaking of America, he said, as a nation, no greater mistake can be made than to show disrespect to the women who have devoted their lives to the welfare of their families. And so it's a big deal, and uh, we're in the middle of a sermon series here at Trinity on, on work, and we've been looking at what God has to say about uh, different types and kinds of work, and it seems like a good idea on Mother's Day, I think, to consider the work of, of mothering this morning, and I'm not just talking about uh, having children and looking after a young baby, as important as, uh, as those tasks are. I'm really talking about something bigger than that. I'm talking about the task of caring for a family, of making a home. And uh, I wonder if it would surprise you to know or to discover that God has something to say about those things and is concerned about those things. Uh, I wonder if it would surprise you to discover that God wrote the manual on, on mothering and on motherhood and, uh, and loves those th- things. And uh, uh, believe it or not, um, you can only really know how something works uh, when the person who made it tells you, why they made it and how they made it and what they made it to do and how it works. And uh, that lesson is a lesson that none of us learn, apparently. Uh, My understanding is that the majority of people never, ever read instruction manuals, ever. Uh, Particularly, that's particularly true, apparently, of motor cars, mobile phones, computers and smart TVs. Uh, we just bumble our way through those products. Uh, Superu decided that they'd fix it by reducing their 480-page car manual down to eight pages. Eight pages. And then they did a survey and found no one read the eight pages anyway. <laughs> so they just went back to the 480 document. Why don't we do read the manuals? Uh, I think we all think that we probably know how it works best anyway or we're too lazy or we don't have time or we think it probably doesn't matter in the end uh, until it all goes wrong, of course. And the the consequences are we often have products in our life and in our home uh, which are a lot lot better than we realise or have imagined. And I guess the flip side of that is that we can destroy things in our ignorance. Uh, Now, why am I telling you this on Mother's Day? Um, It's because I wonder if that's happened in regards to mothering and motherhood and homemaking. And it's as if we've thrown out the manual and we've not listened to the one who created it and who loves it And therefore, we've forgotten just how wonderful those things really are. And we've not realised, I think, what what a privilege. I mean, it's hard work. Those things are hard work. But there's a privilege in them that we've lost sight of. Um, A privilege to be the one who, who serves and cares for a family in God's view of things. That is a high position, a privilege and a blessing to be the person who serves and cares for others. Uh, Worse than that, perhaps, we're in danger of destroying it in our our ignorance. Uh, It strikes me that a paid full-time woman in the workforce is praised and valued in a way an unpaid full-time mother and homemaker is simply not praised in our culture. That seems to me to be more and more the case. Uh, I think if you're committed to mothering and being a mother, then you're really being pushed to the, to the, 
to the side by our culture, which, which claims to have a high view of mothering. It says, look, we spend $2.1 billion on mothers for one day a year. But by and large, we live in a society that says, well, yeah, other than that, mothering doesn't really matter. Uh, certainly if you judge by the things that we do. So as a nation, we, we just continue to, have, to produce smaller and smaller generations of children. In, a, in, in 2022, 12 .2, there are 12.2 births to every 1,000 people. In the 1960s, it was 27, so more than double. Now, in the 1860s, it was 42. And it's just been a steady decline, 70% decline in having a family. Now, look, there are, there are no doubt several reasons for that, and it's a complex thing, and I don't, um, get, I don't want to guess this morning at some of those things, but at least one of them must be that mothering seems to have been classed as second rate. Certainly having children or having lots of children seems to have been frowned upon. And even when children are born, uh, more, now more than, more than ever it seems that they are quickly shipped off to grandma or to strangers to care for them and raise them when they're only four months, six months, 12 months old so that mothers can get on with the important things, the career and the job outside and the pursuits. And so their freshest energies and their best hours of the day are given to someone else and something else. And we don't question that very loudly today. We don't wonder about, how, is that a good thing? I don't know whether you've heard the name Steve Bidoff, well, he's an Australian, and uh, he's a parent educator uh, with, uh, by now, about 40 years of experience, and he's sold many books, about 4 million book sales. And uh, he's a lo lovely fellow. I went, to, I went to a conference in which he was speaking at Darling Harbour in Sydney uh, on raising boys, and he's got a fantastic book on raising boys, and uh, I was as lost as you can be in Darling Harbour. It's like a rabbit warren there. And uh, I, I saw a fellow coming towards me. I said, do you know where the Steve Bidoff lecture is? And he said, yeah, it's this way. And I put out my map and said, are you sure? Because it looks like it's that way. He said, no, no, my name's Steve Bidoff and we're going this way. <laughs> Great way to introduce yourself to the speaker. He said, uh, and he did a lot of research on this. And uh, he came out and he said, the growing evidence all says clearly that one to three-year-olds should not go into institutional daycare. And uh, he goes on to say, and it's actually detrimental to them. And we, by and large, in Australia, have ignored, ignored all of that evidence. Um, when, did, when did you hear that spoken about on the news? When did you see that on a TV show? Where, where have you seen that information broadcast all across Australia? You, you YouTube that and you don't find it either. It's, it's been done a little bit in England on Steve Bidoff's um, research. If, if the TV show The West Ring is right, and some people will think everything in The West Ring is right, but if the, if the TV show The West Ring is right, all the, all the people who prevent the, present the news put their children in, in, into institutional daycare and so they don't want to interview Steve Bidoff. But why have we ever put such pressure on, on, on mothers to do that? Have we forgotten how precious and how wonderful and how important a task mothering is? Or homemaking. Um, taking care of a family. Why is that so laughed upon? In, in just two years ago, um, Channel 9's Today Show found a Facebook post from a homemaker and a mother whose name was Brooke. 
She had four children. And I don't know, Brooke, but this is what she wrote in her Facebook post. I always make sure I don't go to bed until everyone's lunches are packed. Their clothes are set out for the next day, including my husband's, and the house is clean, dishwasher is on, and a load of washing on. Sometimes it means to get, I go to bed at nine. Sometimes it means I go to bed at midnight. But I always get up early, 4.30, with my husband to make him breakfast and coffee. And, uh, well, the Today Show loved that post. Uh, they thought it was the funniest thing they'd heard of in a, in a long time. And they spent uh, a good 15 minutes laughing and mocking and rolling their eyes. I mean, how stupid to be a homemaker like this woman. And they called her, um, perhaps the biggest uh, taboo you can call a woman nowadays, they called her a 1950s housewife. Those poor 1950s housewives, they're the butt of every joke, aren't they? Uh, then, she, then they said she must be hypnotised because no sane woman would want to do that for her husband or do that for her family, so this, this girl must be hypnotised. And they called her husband lazy and disabled. It was a pretty staggering 15 minutes of TV, really. And on they went. Martin Isles of the Australian Christian Lobby said, what if Brooke had said this in her post? I always make sure I don't go to bed until all my client emails are sent and my work is updated. And I wake up at 4.30am to get ahead of a busy day and check in with my boss and start work on the right foot. Sometimes that means I miss out on sleep. But hard work has seen me promoted and given me high status in my company. I hope to make CEO next year. Would that, would that, text, would that Facebook post have received the same level of mocking, do you think? Or is that just for homemaking? Is that the only task that we mock. How many people do you think in their dying moments say, oh, I wish I'd sent more work emails in my life? How many do you think say, oh, I wish I'd cared for my children better? Or I wish I loved my family more opportunities than I took. It's like we've thrown out the manual and we ignore the one who's made us and the one who invented motherhood in all of its wonder, in all of its goodness, and we've said, well, we know better. The passage uh, that was read to us this morning comes from a book, a book of, called Proverbs. And uh, Proverbs is a book in which God tells us uh, in really a lots of practical, everyday ways how he made the world to work. And it's a little bit like an instruction manual in some ways. Uh, it describes how God put the world together and how he intends it to run in, in everyday things. So, for example, um, in it, God says to, to lazy people, you know, look at the ant, he says. And learn from the ant and be wise like the ant and work hard. In other words, God's saying, I've, I've made humans and not to be lazy, but to be productive and engaged in all sorts of activities, whether, whether paid or unpaid. Uh, that's the way I've made them to be. So Proverbs is like that. God tells us how he's made us to be and how he made the world to work. And so here at the end of Proverbs, uh, we have this portrait of a wife and a homemaker and uh, it's not just a suggestion of uh, here are 16 different things in which I've, uh, ways I've made, made women or made wives. Um, he's saying that this, this, this is a design that I've put in place. And so in verse 11, the heart of a, um, the heart of a husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. Verse 15, she rises when it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. Verse 21, she is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Verse 27, she looks well to the ways of her household, she does not eat the bread of idleness. The children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. She might be mocked on. Channel 9, but she's not mocked in the book of Proverbs. 
At least half of the book, at least half of this section in Proverbs is um, she is concerned with her home. Her priority is her home and her children and her husband and and she has maid servants. That doesn't mean she doesn't do anything outside the home. She does. She buys a field, she sells cloth. Uh, But her focus and her priority and her passion uh, is her home. Now, look, if you're like me, you you read this section of Proverbs and you get exhausted just reading about what this lady does. But I don't think it's... I don't think it's a day in the life of. I certainly hope it's not a day in the life of. It's, ra- it's not her to-do list on the fridge, but rather it's, um, it's a portrait of her life. And there are times in her life when she is consumed with young children. There are times in her life when those children are older. There are times in her life when they've left home. And she does different things at different times. But the point I want you to see is that By including this passage in the book of Proverbs, the Lord is saying it matters. This is really precious. This is to be prized. Being a homemaker matters. Being a mother matters. Being uniquely female matters. It's the way God made things. And he he didn't make a mistake. It wasn't an accident. He hasn't made females to be just the duplicate of males. God didn't make a woman to be good at doing all the same things that a man does. And he didn't make a man to be good at doing all the same things a woman does. He made them wonderfully different and with different abilities and different skills. So when they come together, there's a lovely complementation so that they can do things together. They complement each other. And so they can do things together that they can't do apart. And, and the woman is a heart of a home in a way that a man almost can never be. And the woman is a homemaker in a way that a man can almost never be. She has gifts and skills and abilities. And that's the way God has made it. And it's good. And he loves it. And uh, men, the next time we hear someone be dismissive and call a particular job woman's work, then we need to make sure... Well, I won't tell you what to do to that person, but you need to deal with them, don't you? Let's not belittle it. Being a mother, mothering, being a homemaker, let's not belittle or demeaned by God. He says it's so good. Now, can I say again, it doesn't say that women should never work outside the home. But it does say that there's an orientation that is good. And generation after generation, we produce sons and daughters who need mothers to be there and to be focused on them and to recognise their problems and needs and to support and guide and see and listen and love and want them. That's not a mistake. God didn't make a mistake in his assignment and it's a worthy assignment and it's an essential assignment and to abandon it is to abandon a high calling, the highest calling, and to cling to a lesser thing. Now there's much more that could be said, of course. Uh, Time is limited on any Sunday morning. Um, But let let me say this. Why do you think it is that the way the world around us sees, sees things is so often the complete opposite of the way in which God sees things. We've spoken a little bit about motherhood and homemaking, but you name any topic. And what you'll find what God says about it, the world says almost the opposite. The world says, get money and it will make you alive. God says, beware of money, it will kill you. The world says, promote yourself and be well known. God says, be a servant of others and serve me. The world says, true happiness is found in yourself. God says, true happiness is found in the Lord Jesus Christ and serving him. Why is it like that? Why are we like that? God says one thing and we believe another. 
And it's because there's something wrong with the world and there's something wrong with us. And deeply entrenched in the human heart is this little voice that says, you can work it out and you don't need to listen to the one who's made you and you don't need to read his manual and you can ignore him and it's okay. Now, can I say, ignoring the instruction manual for an iPhone is sometimes funny and sometimes disastrous, but we mostly sort of manage as we get along through life. Ignoring the one who made us and the way he made us and not following him as our king is far more serious than we could ever, ever imagine. In, in verse 10, it's a, in, in chapter 31 here, it says, an, an excellent wife who can find... She's far more precious than jewels. And I'm sure that's a true statement. And I think God might be telling us something just a little bit deeper. As you read through, you wonder whether this woman exists. Um, This woman who follows God's way so perfectly, can she be found? I think it's God's way of saying that this woman um, doesn't exist. There's no woman that follows me perfectly like this. Just like there's no man who follows me perfectly and there's no boy and there's no girl. And the Bible says when we're given the opportunity, we don't follow the Lord and we don't seek to to live for his glory. We either do things for our own ends or we just ignore him. And uh, it's a serious problem. And God says it's a bit like pretending. We pretend that we're the king. And that Jesus is not, and we pretend that we know better than him. And God says that's incredibly foolish, and he calls on us to stop pretending. Um, A friend of mine uh, used to love telling the story about um, going to a party after just reading a book on on the Russian involvement in World War I. And even though he's read no other book on the Russian involvement in World War I, Uh, At this party, uh, he met some poor, unsuspecting soul and spent the next 30 minutes telling him everything that he'd learnt from that book about the Russian involvement in World War I and speaking as if he was uh, the number one expert on the subject. And uh, when he he said, when he he stopped and uh, came up for breath, he asked asked the guy's name and then asked what he did. And the fellow said, well, uh, I'm a lecturer here at the university and you'll be interested to know that I did my PhD on the Russian involvement in World War I. Now, at that point in time, I don't know what you would do. I mean, you can go and hide in the toilet and ignore the guy for the rest of the night. Uh, you can keep rabbiting on, on uh, as if you really are um, an expert on the subject when you know for sure that compared to this fellow, you, you're not. Um, what do you do? Do you keep pretending? Or do you stop And do you confess your ignorance? And do you listen? Uh, When I encountered Christianity and began to understand what it was really on about, um, I think my biggest problem was right at that point. I didn't want God to be God over me. Well, at least not over me. I didn't mind the fact that he was God over other people. In fact, I thought there were some people that he needed to be God over because they were so painful. I just didn't want him to be God over me. And the truth is, I tried to relate to God as if he wasn't a specialist and I knew it all. After all, I'd read one book. And when God says, I made you and I know you and I made you to follow Jesus the King, he knew what he was saying. What what about you? What What will you do when you come face to face with the living God? What will you do if you find that you've ignored him your whole life? What will you say on that day? And it might be that today for the first time, God has let you realise that you've spent your life ignoring him. And you've suddenly realised that what a foolish thing that is to do. And today would be a wonderful day to come to him and say sorry for that. And I tell you what you discover in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a king who loves to forgive people who have mucked it up and ignored him. 
And he loves to be merciful to those who seek after him and seek his forgiveness. And he loves, he loves to, to make them follow him. That he might be their king. If that's you this morning, today could be a great Mother's Day, couldn't it? A day in which you come to know Jesus as your king and your saviour. Let's not keep pretending, shall we? Let's not keep pretending that we know it all and God doesn't. Let's rather turn to him and discover that he's the king that loves to forgive sinners. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the way in which you have designed things and designed us. Thank you for the way in which you've made men and women to be so different and uh, in such wonderful ways. Lord, we thank you for mothering and we thank you for uh, the gifts you've given to women to be so good at that task. Lord, for homemaking, for caring for a family. Lord, they are good things and we thank you for them. Lord, forgive us for every time in which we believe that we know better in every subject that there is to know. Forgive us. Help us to see how serious it is to ignore Jesus the King and uh, bring us on our knees to him, we pray, that we might find in him the most, most wonderful forgiveness. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.